At one point, not so long ago, 30 or 40 years, if you were an enthusiastic car owner, the chances are that you were also someone who didn't mind turning a wrench every now and then to work on your car. Either you serviced your vehicle yourself or you knew enough about mechanics to get yourself out of a sticky situation. In the same way, if you were into computers at a similar point in history, you probably knew your way around the command line interface of some description, be it a DOS prompt, the basic programming language, or if you were super leet, some form of machine code compiler. The same was true of so many other things at the time, from kitchen appliances to radios. In fact, there was at one time a heavier emphasis on fixing things yourself, and the exact ins and outs of how things work tended to be less hidden behind shrouds of mystery. Today, that is not the case. As things have become more complicated, we consumers have generally become less inclined to work on things ourselves, and for good reason. The level of complexity in modern gadgets, appliances, and cars are now generally well beyond the level of understanding for most laypeople. While there are those who still seek to understand every aspect of how things work, I'm actually one of them, and I feel an almost uncontrollable curiosity over mechanical, hardware, electrical, and software operations, the majority of the population are okay with the term, it just works. And that's a good thing, since most of the software that runs on embedded systems inside everything from our cars to our cookers is closed source, or at least open sourced in some extent, but proprietary enough that it's hard to tweak or modify things yourself, unless you're the kind of person for whom reverse engineering chip design or engaging in some packet sniffing is your idea of a good night out. The reduced opportunities for the layperson to modify or tinker with things they own or use has some advantages. It reduces the risk that someone who doesn't truly understand what's going on under the hood will break or damage something. And it also allows the companies who made the software or the device to ensure that it works the way they intended it to. And by further restricting who can service or work on their products, it means that every individual company can ensure that they retain control over the entire user experience from start to finish, including when things go wrong. But it also means that it's easier for companies to lock down features and specific capabilities to a tiered purchase system, which of course is where we are today when it comes to Tesla and its ongoing fight with third-party specialists who've figured out through reverse engineering ways to get Teslas to do things that perhaps Tesla would rather you didn't do, or at best, you pay a princely sum to activate. I am, of course, talking about the ongoing battle between Nginx and Tesla over the form's development of custom hardware that can be installed into a Tesla to slash acceleration times, tweak the car's traction control to enable drift mode, and even turn a single motor Model 3 into a dual motor Model 3, once you've actually physically added a second motor and drivetrain, of course. The various products that Nginx have launched each do subtly different things, but the most basic of them, the Boost 50, offers 50 extra horsepower from a stock Model 3 drivetrain, which drops sprint times, and it was offered for sale at about half of the price of what Tesla charges customers for a software over-the-air unlock to do exactly the same thing. Tesla, as you might expect, hasn't been happy about it, and just last week Tesla pushed a new over-the-air software update to detect Nginx's hardware, displaying a warning on the center console of customers' cars which says, quote, incompatible vehicle modification detected, potential risk of damage or shutdown. That warning is particularly interesting though, since the third party, lower cost option, effectively does exactly the same as Tesla's software unlock. Nevertheless, Nginx in double quick time has rolled out what it's calling the Nice Try module, something that it's now offering to customers for free with their equipment that should again resolve any issues that Tesla's latest software update caused. In addition, it's also rolling out a new bonus module, which turns on extra features in certain Teslas, including manual wiper control, something we've talked about before on this channel, battery pack heating, automatic front and trunk opening, automatic driver's door opening, ambient lights, heated rear seat controls from the rear of the vehicle, and a few other important tweaks. 
these do essentially add extra value to existing Teslas whose owners have not yet activated those features. In some cases, they add features currently not implemented as a standard by Tesla. It's likely Tesla will continue to chase Nginx in a cat versus mouse style for as long as it can. And if I'm honest, I expect Tesla to refuse to service modified vehicles and perhaps even try to refuse any warranty claims of owners' cars that have been modified. After all, these aftermarket parts are aftermarket. But is Tesla right to be so severe in its attitude towards customers who are going third party in a world where pay to unlock software is quickly becoming a new standard? Should customers have access to the software within the car they own? Or is it just being borrowed or leased by them while they own their car? I am not a copyright lawyer or an IP or a patent lawyer. Yes, I think those are all subtly different. But in a world where people are quickly splitting along lines of right to repair versus rights of companies to say who gets to work on their devices and even how replacement parts are sourced and used, I think there's no clean cut answer here. In the world of computers, we have long been used to this. Apple has, for a really long time, put some pretty severe restrictions on who officially can and cannot repair its devices. It's even pushed out software updates in the past that physically break or brick devices that have been repaired with third-party unofficial parts. And now it makes computers that are digitally locked to specific hardware with its various iterations of the T-prefaced security chipsets. In recent months, thanks in part to hard work from advocates like iFixit and other right-to-repair groups, it appears Apple may be about to change its stance on those third-party repairs and repairs at home. But Tesla is very much working to the same template Apple has for years. It doesn't like customers working on their own vehicles. It has a very stringent approach to third-party repairs and, of course, as we've known for a while, It disables certain features on, or rather blacklists, cars that have been declared insurance write-offs. Depending on whom you listen to, this is either an attempt to prevent third-party specialists and DIY enthusiasts from retitling salvaged Teslas in order to ensure that former salvaged cars are not a danger to the general public, or the same to prevent them from being a damage to Tesla's reputation when they go wrong, Or it's an attempt to lock down Tesla's repair pipeline to ensure that Tesla retains control at every part of the process in a monopolistic move. Or it's just a good way to ensure Tesla can sell new cars to customers when their existing Teslas get in a wreck. And no, to be super clear here, I'm not stating any of these as my personal opinion. I'm quoting the various explanations I've heard being talked about this policy, ranging from people that are Tesla fans through to those who I could say border on being Tesla Q. The reality as I see it is somewhere in the middle. Tesla keeps tight reins on its software and hardware and limiting who can work on its cars and prohibiting the use of third party mods means that it can keep its IP safe and its income stream safe as well as ensure that it doesn't have any bad publicity from things going wrong with a car that isn't stock. Plus, its over-the-air software unlocks are a big revenue stream for the company, if not now, in the future, and it does make sense for Tesla to want to protect that. When Tesla was a young startup, this approach would maybe make more sense, but in a world where Tesla is now the seventh largest company in the world by market cap, Its weekend stock split resulted in a 12% surge today that pushed the valuation of the company to more than $430 billion. I believe it could do several different things to get around this problem. First, it could drop the price of its software unlocks. I get that Tesla is working to increase the value of its vehicles and that autopilot features are expected to make Tesla's increase rather than decrease in value over time. But if there is a third party firm out there that is offering what Tesla is doing at half the price, well, then Tesla could theoretically drop the price of its software unlocks for faster sprint times, as well as offer cheaper other OTA unlocks, at least initially. Personally, I don't like this solution as it's effectively using Tesla's might to try and strong arm a cottage industry out of existence. But the second solution is one I think is more preferable and sustainable. 
That would be to start working alongside third parties with some kind of certified product program, similar to the Works with Apple program that Apple has been running for years. There's no reason why Tesla couldn't offer certification to third party suppliers in order to certify and essentially bless third party mods and upgrades for customers' cars. After all, most companies out there publish lists of products that are complementary to their own devices. Even this camera I'm using to film this video today has a list of hard drives and accessories that have been given a blessing by Blackmagic to be used with the camera. So why not do the same thing with Tesla? Ultimately though, I think Tesla needs a change of attitude towards third-party mods or risk being tarred with the same brush as John Deere has in the past for failing to let farmers work on their own tractors or combine harvesters. In the automotive world, while casual drivers lost interest in tinkering with their cars decades ago, enthusiasts and hardened gearheads have used third-party mods to constantly tweak their cars and get the very best out of them. If you need more power in an internal combustion engine vehicle, well, engine swaps, air intake mods, overbores, intercoolers and turbos have all become pretty standard for those really wanting to push the envelope. More extreme mods do happen, but when they go wrong, it's usually the responsibility of the owner, not the automaker, to deal with the aftermath. And warranty acts in the US are pretty clear. If you've tinkered with the car and something goes wrong, the automaker just has to prove that your modification was what caused the problem. But in Tesla's case, I'm getting the logs that Tesla cars produce would be pretty darned helpful in proving that fact without too much in the way of wasted time and resources on Tesla's part. Ultimately, if you've purchased a car lock, stock and barrel and you're modifying it through a third party upgrade, the onus is on you as the owner. I installed a tow hitch to my Chevy Bolt and if I break it because I'm towing something I shouldn't, well, ultimately that's my fault. My local dealership knows there's a hitch on there and still services the car. They'll still fix it if it goes wrong. I won't be cut off from official after service support because I dared to do something third party. But if and when something goes wrong because of that modification, I will have to pay the consequences, either financial or mechanical. The same would be true of any modifications to my car's battery pack, its charging system or anything else. And I think that Tesla and the rest of the automotive industry could and should embrace that fact. Tesla's job as an automaker is to make cars and help the transition towards cleaner forms of energy, encourage mass adoption of EVs, and make the world a better place. Not to play cat and mouse games with a company that's smart enough to reverse engineer a solution. And just think about it. If you are a third party company that is a lot smaller than Tesla and you're about to bet your reputation on a product you've made for a Tesla, wouldn't you go through some due diligence to make sure that it wasn't going to cause problems anyway? That's it. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.